welcome. I want to thank all of you brave souls for coming out in this terrible weather. We had such a dilemma this morning of whether to shut down or not, and I said, 32 years we haven't missed a date yet, and we've had a day worse than this. So thank you much, so much for venturing out. It's great. Appreciate it. The topic of logistics is so often minimized in history, in, uh, in, in importance. You know, it's always the battles. It's the planes. It's the tanks. It's the uh, strategy. It's, it's all that stuff. But logistics is, if, if you don't bring the beans, the, the bullets, the gasoline, nothing happens. And um, I, um, I wasn't really aware of, of the, the person that he was writing about, General Lee, not Robert E., not the Civil War. But uh, this evening you're going to hear a very interesting program on a very interesting person, and I'd like to introduce Hank Cox to you this evening. Hank, come on up, buddy. As Will Rogers used to say, it's my job to talk, it's your job to listen, and whoever gets done first can just get up and leave. <clears throat> Uh, this story is about uh, Lieutenant General John C.H. Lee. He was from Kansas. Uh, a very, a very able man, a brilliant young Army officer, graduated near the top of his class from West Point in 1909. Uh, he fought in World War I. He made a lot of really useful contacts. General Mark George Marshall, uh, Brian Somerville, uh, Douglas MacArthur, and a lot of other people. He was one of the senior smartest guys in the Army uh, coming out of World War I. He was a decorated guy. He was infantry. He was in the Corps of Engineers in the, uh, uh, in the 20s. He was in charge of the, at Vicksburg, the, uh, the uh, Corps of Engineers station. He was there for the Great Flood of 1927, which was just an awesome thing that we most of us Weren't, didn't have to live through it, but it was a terrible thing. In the 30s, like most of the Corps of Engineers, he was involved in a lot of the public works projects uh, going on around the country to put people to work and do things that needed doing during the Great Depression, which, in which for some reason the, uh, the uh, uh, economy just wasn't working as it should. Uh, so he, at the, all those years, he was solidifying his friendships his relationships with se other senior officers who would play such a big role in World War II. Uh, now, it needs to be said then and later, one of the odd things about Lee, or at least eccentric things that stood out, was that he was intensely religious. He went to church every day, every single day of the year. He went to church two or three times on Sunday. When he was a senior officer in World War II, his uh, senior staff had to go with him. And his initials, JCH, the people who decided they didn't like him, would make fun of him saying that JCH actually stood for Jesus Christ himself. It was one of the things that kind of undermined his reputation. Now, at the, when World War II was looming and we knew we were going into the war, he was sent to Texas. He was. Uh, put in command of the uh, second division. Every, he assumed he was going to be leading soldiers in combat. That's what he had done in World War I. But then uh, he was summon, summoned to Washington for a totally unexpected job assignment. Now his good friend Brehan Somerville was one of the senior officers of World War II. And he, he, and, uh, he, he and Lee were very close. He is the guy who built the Pentagon, by the way. He, was, uh, he had had a lot of big projects during the public works during the 30s. They put him in charge of that, and he just rolled over everybody and built that huge building in a year and a half, which, which is still very much in use. But they had come up with a new idea of how to approach World War II. Uh, apparently, during World War I, there had been a lot of chaos miscommunication, a lot of problems in the supply. As uh, Don mentioned to you earlier, this is uh, the orphan child of uh, modern warfare is logistics. You put these big armies out there, 
uh, and everybody likes to be a hero and see their name in the paper. But somebody's got to get the supplies to all of those people. Without the, without the bullets, without the gasoline, without the food, uh, when, when, we hit, when the guys hit the beach in Normandy in, uh, on D-Day and Lee was in charge of the supplies, he had almost three million desperate items that he was responsible for. And we're talking for about everything from candy bars to, to dental supplies, just, just everything that when you put more than a million and a half men into combat, you have to supply all those things. And they don't, it doesn't take care of itself. Now they had decided that instead of having, in World War I, each army, each division was in charge of its own supply and obviously they were competing with each other and there was a lot of skullduggery, everybody trying to get more. So they decided this time there would be one unified command in charge of supply for all the military forces. Now the Army Air Forces were under or the command of uh, Hap Arnold, Army Ground Forces under Leslie McNair, and the Service of Supply under the heretofore mentioned Brehan Somerville. And Somerville, after discussing it with Marshall, who also knew Lee, decided one of their biggest supply problems was going to be supplying the, the U.S. forces in Europe. So they sent, this is in 1942, they sent, they put the job on Lee. He didn't want it, but he got it. You're in charge of all the supplies in the European theater. And in May of 42, he was off to Great Britain. But on the way, he stopped to see in New York the General Harbord, who had been a senior supply officer in World War I, and General Harbord gave him some advice. It was, you're going to need a train, he said. We had a couple of trains in France, and they were just absolutely essential because you have to go around, you have to move around, you have to move stuff around, and the roads will be impassable. Where there are roads, you need a train. So when Lee first got to Great Britain, and Somerville came over, and they were uh, meeting with their British counterparts, Lee said, I'm going to need a train. Uh, now, the Brits were a little bit taken back by that. The, uh, Churchill didn't have a train. Uh, the king had a little train. But he insisted, and the, of course the British absolutely, had, depending on us for their survival, said, okay, you get a train. So for the years, for the two years actually, between the time he showed up and the invasion of Normandy, he was stationed in Great Britain, and it was his job to bring all the supplies that we were sending over there. Now, the, the miracle of World War II really is the American industrial machine. Joseph Stalin acknowledged that. He said, without the American uh, supplies, we could not have won the war against the Nazis. Our industry just kicked into gear after several years of depression, and soon they were grinding out just tens of thousands of tanks and airplanes and just everything that an army that armies need. And we weren't just supplying U.S. forces in Europe. We were supplying U.S. forces in the Pacific, and we were supplying the Russians and the British and, and anybody else who was fighting with us at different times. So we were, in effect, the logistics arsenal of the world. And it was Lee's job to focus that in Great Britain. And Great Britain was a major source of all this stuff because they were getting ready. They knew that eventually they were going to have to invade Europe and they were going to come from Great Britain. And so we were just started within very a few months. We started shipping stuff, ship after ship after ship, military equipment, uh, everything from uniforms to artillery to, to jeeps to trucks. Uh, one, one shipload after another. Of course, at the same time, we were building hundreds and hundreds of new ships called the Liberty Ships, whose only purpose really was to haul stuff to uh, Great Britain. And it was uh, one ship after another coming in and unloading and going back for more. Well, it was very disorganized. They were just putting everything that they had on these ships. They were determined to, they had a phrase, to fill full and down, every ship had to be full of something. And if it wasn't full of a particular thing, they did just whatever else they had, they put on there. But a lot of time the manifests, when there were manifests, did not list what all was on the ship. So they just unloaded it and put it somewhere. They just 
took it off, took it away from the piers and took it out in the, in the uh, countryside and set it down and left. And Lee was in getting all this stuff and he had very few uh, trained supply officers. It's a very, it's a, it's not that complicated, but it's something that usually requires a certain amount of training. And in World War I, about one out of four uh, guys in uniform was in supply and they figured that this was going to be the same. He was asking for three or four hundred thousand people, but all this, the guys back, this began a big tug of war between logistics and combat because the, the, the combat soldiers wanted men with guns in their hands. They didn't want to be bothered with the talk about logistics. And there were just very few people there to explain to them that without the logistics, your combat guys won't have any bullets to shoot. They won't have food to eat. So it was a tug, tug of war. And then, uh, and so, and also it needs to be added that in combat, in, a, in the military, there is a natural tendency to resent the guys in supply because the guys in combat are out getting killed or wounded. They're crawling around in the mud. They're going a long time without food or a hot bath. And the guys in supply are back safe behind the lines, sleeping in warm beds, plenty of food, uh, plenty of women, plenty, plenty of everything, and uh, probably not as much as the guys in war th in the battle thought, but they just naturally resent people, the, the soldiers in supply, and Lee being the senior guy in supply uh, was the focus of a lot of that resentment. Now, Lee also had a reputation for being what they call a martinet. I mean, he was usually always well-dressed. He insisted that everybody obey the rules and, and, and just really strict interpretation of the rules. And people, a lot of the ordinary soldiers resented that sort of thing. They thought he was, thought he was pompous. But at any rate, he was using the people he had and he was taking soldiers trained for combat and putting them into service battalions because he had to get them somewhere. And I've got, uh, I've found uh, some memoirs of a young lieutenant who was a combat lieutenant uh, uh, officer who worked for Lee for about a year and then he ended up going to war. But he, he thought very highly of Lee and he thought everything that uh, Lee was doing was just fine kind of a counterbalance some of the other stuff that, that, that I ran across. So Lee uh, was going about his business. He figured they, they weren't going to invade before uh, late 43 or early 44. So he had time to get all this stuff organized and get ready to go to war, except suddenly he found out in, the, in uh, I think, July of 43 that they had a there was a change of plan the Russians, Stalin, were leaning on Churchill and, and Roosevelt to give them a second front because they were fighting for their lives against the German. Now, the German war machine of World War II was just an awesome force. I mean, it was a, an evil cause they were fighting for, but they were disciplined, they were well-equipped, they were well-led, and they had excellent weapons, and they were just absolutely ruthless. And they, they were... It was a, probably a great thing for the world that Hitler decided to invade Russia because if 65% uh, of all the casualties the, the Germans had, took in World War II were on the Russian front. So it was also important for us to supply them, which we did. But uh, Stalin was reasonably demanding open a second front to take some of the pressure of these Germans off of us. Well, we weren't ready to invade Europe. We didn't have enough people over here. We didn't have enough landing craft to go on the beaches. We were still, you know, starting the war against Japan and the Pacific. So they needed to do something to satisfy Stalin and something to start fighting the Germans. So they decided, well, let's invade North Africa. At the time, you, if you know your history, uh, the German Africa Corps under General Rommel was down fighting Montgomery in Northern Africa in a battle that was going back and forth. And it was decided, all right, we're going to invade Africa. And this was dropped on Lee, and he had like uh, about 90 days. He was supposed to supply a major component of the invasion force going in 
Uh, the other part was coming from Norfolk, Virginia. And uh, he, at that time, his situation was very chaotic. He knew that they had a lot of stuff around the countryside in Great Britain, but they didn't know what was where. He didn't know what all they had. Some of the units had showed up without their equipment. The big Red One division was up in uh, Ireland and it was, didn't have equipment. Other, other armies, the, the men hadn't showed up, but the equipment had. It was just a chaotic situation. And there was a distinct possibility they were going to have to postpone the inv invasion of North Africa for lack of uh, the supplies. And of course, Lee was under the gun. He said, years later, writing his memoirs, he said this was the most desperate time he had had in his entire life uh, because he, he just didn't know if he was going, they were going to be able to do it. And Eisenhower called him in and told him, you, bet, you better get ahead of this thing because your, your heads are going to roll. And Eisenhower could have added that if he didn't get ahead of it, his head might have been among those on the roll. But uh, Lee was a hardworking guy, very well organized, a good manager. Uh, during the great Mississippi flood, he had managed all the, the, the people to working to support the levees and, and break the levees where they wanted the water to, to go through. He managed a lot of big projects during the, uh, during the, during the uh, work projects of the great, great Depression. He was a manager. He was smart as a whip. He was a competent leader. And he called his people in and he read them the riot act. We've got to get this stuff. We've got to find out where everything is. And they just started spread out and they were working 24 hours a day for weeks. And slowly but surely they found everything where everything was. And by the time the deadline rolled around to, to load the ships and send them to Africa, everything was where it should be. And then we went down, our troops went down and, and, and invaded Northern Africa and fought there for several months in some pretty bloody fighting in which we didn't start out doing very well uh, when the first time we fought the Germans, but it was a learning process. And uh, it, eventually we did uh, capture the German soldiers that were left in, uh, I think, more than 250,000 prisoners. And uh, Rommel fled to, to Europe because they didn't want uh, the great hero to be captured. But that was a successful mission. And, Leo, and Lee, Lee did it right. Now, so after that was done, he, would say he returned to the job that he had had before of, uh, of uh, <clears throat> creating the buildup for the invasion of Europe. Now, the, uh, that was to prove to be the biggest and most complicated amphibious operation in, in the history of the world, and it is extremely unlikely that we will ever see anything like it again. Like I say, he had three million uh, discrete items that he was in charge of, and he had, he had about three or 400,000 people under his command, not enough to do what he was supposed to do, but, but he was getting it done. One of the big things that they knew that they would have to have was a port to unload this stuff uh, because it didn't do them any good in Great Britain. They had to take it to Europe. And initially, when they invaded on, on D-Day, June 6, 1944, they were having, I mean, you have to have, to keep a division in the field, you just need about 10,000 tons of supplies every day. It's just when you've got a division of maybe 15,000 men and they're each individual soldier is uh, using about 60 or 70 pounds of stuff if you if you divide it all up in the gasoline the food and everything else it's it's a huge demand it should be uh, mentioned also that I learned in this if I didn't know it already that American soldiers were very wasteful they just I guess they it was the uh, from the Great Depression when there wasn't enough to eat and suddenly they had plenty of food and plenty of cigarettes and they just, they just wasted stuff like crazy. Both of our, the, our enemies and our allies were just amazed and appalled at the waste of the U.S. soldiers. 
But these guys, you know, they figured there was a pretty good chance they were going to get killed and they were not going to be worried about uh, wasting a little bread or, or food or clothing. They just, and if they had, if it was hot and they had too many clothes, they just threw stuff away. They weren't planning for the winter. Anyway, we had to capture a port. Well, there was one port right there near Normandy, Cherbourg. It was not a big port, and the Germans had it, and they held on to it. They fought to keep us out of it for a long time, for several weeks after, after the invasion of Normandy, and then they just tore it all to pieces. So it was a long time getting that port up and running. And even when they got it running, and before the war it had been just for cruise ships to come in and it was just one ship at a time. So it wasn't much of a port for the past, for the first three months or so of the invasion of Europe, the, uh, all the supplies had to come across the beach. Now, we, we knew that this was likely to happen, so we built two great big things, I would guess. They called them mulberries, but they were floating docks, A and B, and they, and they moved them across the, uh, the, the English Channel, and we're going to use them to unload supplies as if they were, in fact, permanent ports. And after about two weeks, they had one of the biggest, toughest storms that they'd ever seen, and they tore up the one that the U.S. was depending on. The other mulberry was up north for the British, and that for some reason survived the storm, but ours was blown apart, so we didn't have the mulberry. We had, uh, we had landing craft, the LSTs. Uh, we had uh, the little ducks, the D-U-K-W, little thing, floating, sort of like floating tanks that would go up on the beach, could, could go through the water and didn't drive up on the beach, not very fast, but they, they gave us some mobility. But then we were just ended up stacking like we had in Great Britain. We ended up with just rows and rows, of stacks of equipment and material near the beach, a little bit further, further on from the beaches uh, where, the, where they could get, uh, uh, you know, which was the only, and it was almost as confused as it had been in Great Britain. Now, another thing that when, when uh, th that should be mentioned here is that in World War II, African Americans were not allowed to serve in combat units. There were a couple of exceptions here and there, but for the most part, they, they just believed that white soldiers and black soldiers couldn't work together and they wouldn't, wouldn't have it. So most of the blacks, the African Americans who served in the combat were in service uh, units, which means that almost all of them were in Lee's command. That was fine with Lee. He, he liked African Americans. He thought they were getting the raw deal and that they were underused. And he never was shy about telling people that. And it was yet one more thing that his other senior officers, most of whom had those southern attitudes about minorities just resented him for because they, 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 he, he was not a regular guy. They weren't used to hearing that kind of talk. There'll be more about that in a minute. But these were the guys driving the LSTs up on the, on, on the beach. And not surprisingly, there was one black general that they had promoted, uh, Benjamin Davis, to the command, and he was sent to Great Britain because there were some there was some friction between uh, white and black soldiers. Our white soldiers just would see blacks socializing with, with British women or eventually French women, and they were just totally offended that, that, that this was going on, and there would be fist fights and things breaking out. So they sent General uh, Davis over there, and not surprisingly, he found up working with Lee, and the two of them just hit it off famously, and they, they, they worked very closely together to help resolve racial strife in the, in, among the uh, combat units in Europe. And there's, there's a little funny anecdote. I got, had a biography of Davis, and Davis, of course, spoke very highly of Lee. He was the only senior commander who treated him like a human being, uh, and they got along just fine. But in a letter to his wife, 
he, he said uh, that Lee was, he, the quote is, he, he was worse than Ma about church. Because even, <laughs> even Davis, uh, Davis was a Christian, but he was not accustomed to going to church every day of the week and two or three times on Sunday. Uh, the, uh, you know, I, I can't help but mention that there was, in D Washington, D.C. at the time was just packed with people who came from all over the country to run the new war machine. And everything was in short supply, including transportation. And they needed more bus drivers. But they simply refused to hire African Americans to drive the buses in Washington, D.C. They just refused, any more than they would allow them to go to the theaters with white people. And it was also a rule that when the Red Cross, Cross collected blood for wounded military men, they had to keep the blood from Negroes separate from white people. Now, every doctor who had ever gone to medical school knew that there was no difference between the blood of a black man and a white man. But the, the uh, racists in Congress, the Southern bigots, just stamped their feet. And so that, that folly played out over a long period of time. So, we were, so Lee was dealing with that mentality when he was uh, the champion of the African Americans. And that was one of the things uh, that, that, that tarnished his reputation, or at least whenever they ran short of anything, and they, they frequently ran short of stuff, uh, they blamed Lee. Now, they, when we invaded Europe, uh, Lee got high marks. They got everything across the, uh, the, uh, the English Channel. They had plenty of supplies to start with, just coming up on the beach. And uh, Lee got a lot of credit for that. But before long, you will, uh, oh, I know I should, I'm almost forgetting about this. These are a couple of shots of all the, uh, some of the sites in Great Britain where they just loaded up with all this military gear. This is a Nissan hut. They had to build a lot of accommodations. They ended up with more than a million Americans there and they, they didn't have Motel 6 in Great Britain back in 1942. They had, to, they had to concoct, they had to put together places for everybody to live and stay. It was, uh, it was a kind of interesting thing. The Brits, of course, were depending on us to save their society, but they, uh, there was a common complaint. The trouble with the Yanks was that they were overpaid, oversexed, and over here. The, the uh, typical GI made twice as much money as a British soldier, and, and it, was, uh, it wasn't all, I mean, th there was a lot of resentment there, and you can understand why it would be. At any rate, uh, we were, our forces were stuck on the, uh, in the combat at, once they had gone ashore at Normandy. But finally, uh, we broke through, and uh, Patton was on his famous in run. It was an amazing achievement. He took his armored divisions around the, uh, the, the German left wing, and pretty soon they were running hell for leather across the countryside and, and just going a mile a minute and, and uh, getting around the Germans and the, forcing the Germans back. And it was a great uh, military coup, but there's an old saying of people in the military that uh, the tactical brilliance is, uh, is the death to the people in logistics because there was no plan to supply armed forces that far away. And there was no way. The, the railroads had been blown up during the bombardment before D-Day. They were rebuilding the railroads, but that take, took time. They needed a port, but they couldn't find a port. There were a couple of little ports here and there, but nothing nearly enough to, uh, to, to provide the, uh, the flow of supplies that they needed. And so when Patton pulled this great military success, which is, goes down in history as one of the great uh, achievements of warfare and made him a national hero and, uh, of course, movies about him and all that, 
But Lee was the guy who was supposed to get fuel and food and bullets to, all the, to these guys who every day were 30 or 40 miles further away. And there was nobody there to tell him you know, how to do this. He just had to figure it out on the spur of the moment. And the only thing he had going for him was trucks. He'd, he had anticipated he was going to need a lot of trucks, and he had demanded more trucks, but they, they didn't give him all he wanted. They, and he ended up wishing, everybody wished that they had given him more trucks. But he started what became known as the Red Ball Express. It was the only way, and the main beneficiary of this was uh, Patton's Third Army, which was uh, doing great things in the field. But uh, there, there's this uh, great line in the movie Patton where he's bogged down and he can't go anymore because he doesn't have a fuel for his tanks. He said, he says to uh, Bradley, he says, my, my men can eat their belts, but the tanks have got to have gas. And f from time to time, it was, it, it, the advance was slowed down. They, author they knew they were, cre Eisenhower knew he was creating a big problem with this, but they had the Germans on the run and it seemed like they were on the verge of just rolling them up and bringing the war to an end very quickly and everybody wanted to do that if they possibly could. And they were, they were punishing the German military pretty strongly and, and making great success. But the Germans also knew that we were running, uh, we had a very weak connection. We were running, we were running short of uh, su the supply chain was very fragile and they were trying to take advantage of it. And if they didn't have enough trouble, uh, Omar Bradley did not like General Lee. He just, Lee was very uh, old school and very pompous and Bradley refused to release uh, command of the beach to Lee. And Lee needed, that's where the supplies were coming in. Lee needed that to do his job. But Bradley wouldn't let him take over. He said to some, if it were somebody else, he would, but he wasn't going to let Lee have it. So he held on for a long time and created a big problem. And it was just, I don't know what else to say. Leo, Lee, I guess he resented Lee taking over all those fancy hotels in Paris, like a lot of people did. Uh, it's interesting that, that Beetle Smith, Eisenhower's deputy, and, and, and Bradley, and General Hodges, and a bunch of others were constantly sniping at Lee and demanding that, uh, that Eisenhower fire him, and Eisenhower said, and replace him with who? Uh, it was, it, was just, it, was, it became a, just a regular thing that they were kept beating up on Lee and they resented him being in Paris, and they resented his advocacy of African Americans, and all of those things. In the meantime, the soldiers in the field were just going about their business, doing their jobs as best they could. You see a shot of, and here are some of the guys, the Red Ball Express guys, grabbing a bite to eat while they're on the run, running those trucks around the clock, getting the, getting the fuel through. But then, uh, we were slowly but surely winning the war, and there was an assumption by the fall of 1944 uh, that, that it was just a matter of time before the Germans gave in, and so there was no need to disrupt things. Everything was going fine, or so it appeared on paper. But then in December of that year, the Germans launched what we know as the Battle of the Bulge. Hitler had another arrow in his quiver. He launched it at a very weak point in our line of defense, and pretty soon they were running. There was a massive German onslaught of uh, hundreds of uh, top-line tanks, tens of thousands of soldiers charging through the weakest point in the, in the, US, in the Ardennes. And their objective, which Lee and everybody else figured out almost immediately, was they had to capture supplies because we had a lot of supplies to waste, the Germans did not. And in particular, they needed fuel for the tanks. And they were counting on capturing some of the uh, resources that we had, the fuel depots that Lee had put in the countryside to support our tanks going 
going in toward Germany. And this is a high point in Lee's military career. He uh, was everywhere at once. He moved, he figured out which way the Germans were coming and he moved, got everything moved out of their path where they couldn't remove the, the, the uh, petrol, the, 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 the gasoline. They blew it up and they kept, prevented the Germans from capturing the resources that they would have needed to do what they wanted to do. Now by this time, we, uh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself in the story, but we had captured the big port of Antwerp. And that is a major port, still is, and it was a perfect port for what we were trying to do because it had a long estuary up from the ocean and you could take big ships up there and turn them around. And once we had driven the Germans away, and they could no longer block it. it, it we, we were had a lot of supplies coming in. A big objective of the, uh, the Battle of the Bulge was they wanted to uh, recapture Antwerp and drive us out. And in the mean, but they needed to capture fuel. They were unable to do it in large measure because Lee uh, very efficiently had all of that stuff removed from their path where they couldn't get at it. And at the same time, he continued supplying, moving supplies forward to the American forces on other side, on either side of the salient that the, that the Germans had created so that as soon as the, uh, the German offensive was spent, we could resume our march toward Germany, which is what we did. He got, he got high marks for that. Uh, another thing that he did, which was a little bit less popular, at that time, about that time of December, it was becoming clear that we were running short of soldiers. Now, there are only so many American men, and we had armies in Europe, we had armies in the Pacific, Marines and, Arm and Navy and Air Force and every, and working our big industrial machine, there weren't a lot of guys sitting around back here doing nothing. If you weren't, in, if, if somebody wasn't in a uniform, there was probably a good reason. They were badly needed in a particular industry or uh, maybe they were mentally deficient or had were criminals or whatever. They just didn't have enough uh, replacements to send. Uh, Marshall, so General Marshall, the great senior officer said, well, what we're going to have to do is uh, transfer some people from different support units and put, send them into combat. And Lee, on his own volition apparently, although he did clear it with Eisenhower, I know what to do about this. He issued an order that black soldiers who wanted to could transfer into combat units. Now think about this for a moment. In order to do that, if they had rank, and a lot of them did, they were, they were uh, sergeants and uh, NCOs of various levels, in order to join combat units, they had to give up their rank and their pay, extra pay, and become privates again, and pick up a rifle and go join the combat soldiers. Uh, more than 2,000 of them did. They, why did they do that? They, they, given up, they were safe behind the lines. They were, uh, had plenty to eat, and, they, and it was a cold, bitter winter, one of the coldest on record. And those uh, soldiers out there were poorly clad. They did not have warm clothes. It was horrible out there, and plus they were getting their heads blown off at a very high rate. It was just, that's why we were running short of men, that so many were being killed. So you might ask yourself, why did they decide to do this? And I believe the answer is that they had a chance to show the world, and especially their fellow Americans, that they were men as good as any other men. And one of the, uh, Beetle Smith brought Lee in and chewed him out. You couldn't, you did that without telling me, I know this issue. You'll be creating all these problems back in the States. The civil rights groups will be kicking up a fuss saying, you know, they can't go to movies, but you gotta, you're letting them fight. And Lee just stood his ground and said, I just don't believe that at all. That's just not right. And, it, and I, he refused to back down. Even some of these writers who've criticized Leo, Lee so fervently said that he stood tall on that one. And 
in fact, there were no problems with these, these uh, black men going into combat units in, in uh, Germany at that time. Those guys, our guys on the ground, some of them may very well have been racist or whatever, but they, they didn't care. They were happy to have the help, any help they could get in the situation they were in. And three years after the war was over, of course, uh, President Truman issued the famous order uh, desegregating the armed forces, which was, uh, and the, the sacrifice of these men or the demonstration of courage and patriotism that they made, I believe, without doubt, was a huge factor in Truman's decision to do that and the Army's decision to, uh, to back him. But even after all that, and they're going into February and March, and it's pretty obvious that the Germany's on, about to surrender, these other generals were still nagging Eisenhower to find Lee, and their most fire Lee, and the, and the, the, the latest uh, thing about their, here's some more supplies, when they were moving fuel, let me just interrupt myself for a minute, I keep forgetting I have these photos, that these uh, jerry cans, they had millions and millions of jerry cans that they would uh, fill with fuel, and uh, this was what was in a lot of those, uh, uh, those red ball trucks that were moving, moving toward the... Now there's General Eisenhower and that's General Lee driving the Jeep. I forget what that, where that picture is taken from. But at any rate, uh, and the big uh, cr criticism of Lee at this point was they, these guys, were the senior officers were complaining they didn't have enough heavy artillery. The big 240 mm shells that would blow up any kind of German offense that they ran into. And Lee's response had always been, you know, our records show that there should be plenty, but Bradley's people always refused to give an accounting of what they had to Lee. And when the Germans attacked in, in the Ardennes in the Battle of the Bulge, suddenly they had plenty of the heavy artillery, and they used it to great effect against the Germans. But even after that, they went back, back to attacking Lee and demanding to having fired and complaining about a shortage of heavy artillery. So much so that Somerville back at the Pentagon said, okay, they need more. So they started up some production lines to produce these heavy artillery shells. And when the war was over, they did an accounting and discovered that they had fired less than 30% of what they had. They were just lying about it, lying about it in an effort to get Lee fired because they didn't like it. It was, uh, I don't know, it, it, it's hard to explain. This, this is a random photo, that's Eisenhower, General McDarney, there's Lee, and, and, and General Collins. Here is, uh, this is General Somerville on the left and General Lee on the right. This would have been from uh, 43, I believe. Here's uh, Eisenhower and Lee with his back to you on the right a meeting a delegation of, of uh, union, uh, labor union of people who'd come to visit the front. That's Lee there in the middle with just a couple of soldiers. Here's Lee, and the guy on, on the right is Patterson, the secretary of, of the army, who uh, hated Lee, <laughs> like, and he was trying to get Lee fired too, but Lee didn't know it. One of the interesting things about all this stuff is there's no record of Lee ever responding in kind to the critics. He never had anything bad to say about the other generals. He just went about his job and he read the critical things in the press and he was aware of it, but he didn't let it disturb his mind. And I think, I wonder about it sometimes and I think it just was just a product of his strong religious faith that he just let the Lord deal with that and he would just try to do his job. This picture you're looking at now is uh, Lee on the left with Eisenhower who'd come to visit him, which brings me to the capstone of my story that of all the criticisms and bad things said about Lee uh, questioning his ability and his competence, when the war was over, there were three major defeated countries, Japan, Germany, and Italy. 
And MacArthur, of course, became the show, basically the shogun of Japan, which he would rule like a, like a, like a medieval uh, shogun for about five years. And General Lucius Clay, who was one of the most able army officers of World War II, he was stationed in Washington. He never saw combat. He did go to Europe at one point. It was some people wanted him to replace Lee. And frankly, I think he's probably the only person in the army who could have done a better job than Lee just because he was so brilliant. He ended up governing Germany and basically creating the modern West German state and keeping the Russia and the communists out of Germany, preserving the independence of Germany. He was, Lucius Clay is uh, one of the most brilliant military men in our history, but not necessarily for his combat ability. He was just an able man. And then they send, who did they send to govern Italy? John C.H. Lee. Now, if he was so bad, if he was so incompetent, if he was so stupid, why would they do that? And I think it's because Eisenhower realized that he was a very able man and all this criticism of him was not his fault and that he did a really good job. I think also uh, that there was a reason that Lee was, as I mentioned, a, a martinet, by which I mean a military officer who's very strict about the rules and always dresses just so and expects everybody in the ranks to always be dressed uh, neatly and efficiently and to return salutes. And it's the kind of thing that many people in the military who are not really in love with military life resent very much. But in that particular situation, I think they looked at what was going to happen in Italy when the, our occupying forces, they were not the veterans who had fought Germany. Those guys had gone home. These were a bunch of kids new draftees in uniform who hadn't been to combat, and they were being sent to Italy to uh, govern the country, uh, basically for a while. And there were a lot of temptations. They had money, they had food, they had influence, and uh, there was an understanding that what they needed was a tough disciplinarian like Lee to keep them, in, uh, to keep them under control, under restraint, he had a, uh, an educational process when they got in disciplinary problems. He'd, he didn't throw the book at them. He tried to help them get back on their feet, and his objective was to return them to the service and, uh, without anything bad on their records, and he was successful more often than not. He cared about people, but he wasn't going to let them run amok. And he was there for a little over a year as the uh, governor general of Italy, and came, came back in, uh, in uh, I think, in December or, uh, of 47. He, he retired from the military after a long, a long uh, record of successful service. He's buried, he and his wife are buried in Arlington. He was a good man. He was, uh, there was one general, one senior officer who said during all this hullabaloo that went on in 1944, that look about Lee, he said, I really wouldn't want to go fishing for a week with that guy. And I think most of us, knowing what we know about Lee, would say the same thing. Not unless you want to get up every morning and go to church. Uh, that You would want, not want to go fishing for a week with Lee. I, I think Lee would have had an easier road in what he was doing if he had some drinking buddies to back him up. But he didn't have any drinking buddies. He didn't drink. And he, he was just uh, a very well-behaved young man. Any mother would be proud <laughs> of a son like that who, who lived a righteous life, worked hard, was successful. Uh, but I'm sure he was not a fun person at all. He was successful. He did not make a bunch of headlines. This is probably is why I'm the only person so far to write a biography of him. I, I had some reviews in military publications about my book, and one of them, the guy said, this is likely to be the biography of record for General Lee for some time. And I mentioned that to my family, and I have this one smart-ass son-in-law who said, well, it is the only biography of Lee. <laughs> I said, well, I guess you're right. That's it. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it.
Brother. Oh, I forgot. Oh, I forgot. Forgive, forgive me. When Lee first went to France, uh, they hadn't taken Paris yet. So he had to move all his headquarters and his staff, and about several thousand people by this time. But Lee was not a guy for living in tents. He took over this chalet at Valone, and he lived there for a couple or three months till, till the Patton chased the Germans out of Paris. And then he moved, and his guys were living in Quonset huts and tents. And then he moved everything into Paris and took over the, the finest hotels and lived quite well for a guy who didn't drink <laughs> or carry on. I want to add something. Uh, the guide on our tour coming up uh, in May, uh, Dominique Francois, knows the owner of this chateau. And I hope that he's arranging for us. To, we're, we're for sure going to visit it. And I'm hoping we're going to maybe break open a bottle of wine <laughs> while we're there. With in his honor. Yes, we'll do a tribute to General Lee at, at <laughs> okay. the chateau. Was there one other slide? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I, I want they, they these guys did the slideshow. I didn't do the I, for, I, which I appreciate. Thank you. I uh, I actually want to ask a, a, a question um, that uh, why didn't Eisenhower stick up for Lee? Because when Patton was cut off from fuel, it was because Eisenhower had given uh, Montgomery permission to do the market garden. And yeah. so the supplies were diverted from the Americans to the American units involved in market garden. Have you ever heard an answer to that? Well, uh, the, the uh, push and pull with Montgomery was a distinct part of the, uh, of the whole conflict. Now, market garden was totally unlike Montgomery, a very risky thing and it proved to be a poor risk indeed. But what he had been campaigning for all along, Eisenhower insisted on moving forward on a straight line all the way across Europe, which is not really sensible military. Called a broad oh, front. Broad front. Montgomery wanted to shoot right through, cut right through and, uh, at a, on a smaller front and uh, rattle the Germans that way, which was the logical thing to do. And a lot of people would, were asking years after, why didn't you let him do that? And the, the answer was, he was British. And if it did that, it would have made it a big British great success. And the American people would not stand for letting the, uh, the, a British general get the credit for all that, all that uh, military glory. So he continued what they were doing, slowly moving on a, on a consistent line all the way across. But I, I, I guess my point is I'm, I'm disappointed because it was Eisenhower's decision. Beadle, working for Eisenhower, should have known that Eisenhower diverted the troops or d diverted supplies from American forces to support that. Uh, the, the other thing that, that uh, I think needs to be pointed out, and, and your, your comment earlier was so important, the, the, the German submarine warfare in the, in the Atlantic, I, I don't have the, the statistics on that, but I think there was one month in that early part of the war that I, the, I think the number was 245 supply ships were sunk crossing the Atlantic. Now, if, if I were Lee and trying to keep inventory of what came in and all of a sudden... Of these 245 this month, and you know, another month it was 70. I mean, the, the, the number of ships that were sunk by the U boats, and, and we'll have to find that out on our tour because we're going to visit the headquarters for the. Well, uh, I think by the early 43, they were, they were starting to turn. 43. They were turning turn the, the tide on the U boat warfare because they had figured out ways to beat the U-boats. Then they making all the ships go in convoys, which greatly uh, uh, reduced yeah. the uh, ability of the U-boats to... The U they did everything they could with the U-boats. The uh, German U-boats, the crews had a, after the war was over, had a 65% fatality, the highest of any unit. They, they but but uh, you know, again, 
your, your story about filling the ships up, going over, how many were we losing? If, if Lee was expecting ships to come in, expecting supplies, uh, I just can't imagine taking these hundreds of ships and ships that he was expecting that didn't arrive with supplies. Well, we, we kept building more ships. And we kept building ships. I'm going to go up here and ask some questions. Yes, sir. Has anyone written about, on the home front, who <coughs> got things organized so we had all this stuff to send General Lee? I think that's a wonderful question. It's a wonderful topic. I will tell you, and I mentioned this in my book, Way back in the 70s, uh, the Time Life books produced a series, a one volume series of 30 books, one a month. I got, I just, about World War II, and I got them all. I just found them very, and there was one about the home front, about how we turned the economy in our country, which had been moribund, you know, in the Great Depression, when the war broke out, you know, with, uh, we had at one point 30 percent unemployment when there was no safety net and our industries were just sitting there rusting and almost it seemed like overnight we all went back to work and uh, the government really took over the economy and we were building ships right and left we had uh, Kaiser the automaker would took it took over and he didn't know one end of a ship for another but he set up a kind of an automobile uh, system to lay one liberty ship after another, after another, after another. And in that book, and you will find it quoted in my book when you buy it, which I know you will, uh, there is a list, okay, there's a list in there that I copped from that uh, about all the production, the tanks, the trucks, the airplanes, the, the, the artillery, the numbers are just mind boggling and we did it. I mean, it wasn't like we set out Nobody thought when this started out, uh, General Wiedemeyer was supposed to plan ahead uh, for the uh, production, and when he quoted numbers of what we were going to need, people said, that's impossible, that can't be done. We ended up doing twice what he th said we were going to have to do. It was the American people, and we had a generation of people, we were talking, some of us were talking about this the other day, as soldiers, uh, they were just versatile. They were mechanical. American men it came off to, the farm. Knew how to come off the farm. They knew how to fix things. You didn't have to tell them necessarily. The Germans didn't have that. If you were in Germany, if you needed your your vehicle broke down, well, you had to call the guy who had the, that in his job description to fix it. But anybody with a wrench in the American would just go fix it. You know, it was, well, I'm going to interject one thing. You haven't attended all of our programs. <laughs> because I did a program on the home front. Do, do we still have a copy of that book? I can't remember the name of it, but it was about four or five years ago. Uh, it was a professor from Rhode Island. If you go on... What was it? Maury Klein. Maury Klein. Yes. Maury Klein. And I, I, I don't know if... That one is on YouTube. It's not on YouTube? Okay, well, we don't have the book. But uh, we did a program on that to the very, uh, actually, he used the very line that you did, Hank. Uh, and we had people here. We had this guy's father, who is an expert on the modification facility over, which is now the 3M Aviation, which is where they put all the materials on the B-24s that came out of Ford Willow Run. We had a fellow from uh, Milwaukee, an expert on military railroads. We did uh, John Lindley. I saw him come in, talked about the glider production. Uh, Ford turned its Woody station wagon plant into a glider plant and built 5,000 gliders, John? 10,000 10, gliders up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And I can't remember what the other, we, we did four, four that evening, so and I'm getting old and forgetful. And, I'm sure they built gliders right here because my grandfather was building them here. I, I need to have you, right, John has got a manuscript on the glider production. John, recognize, raise, raise your hand. He's got a manuscript on the glider production in Minnesota. We're trying to get that published. So, yeah. <laughs> 
please give me your name and information. I'd like to talk to you more about your, your dad. Any other questions up here? Questions don't, uh, let me come across. Uh, I've got the impression that one of the most criticized actions of General Lee was you know, commandeering all the hotels in mm -hmm. Paris. Did he ever offer a justification for it? And oh. in your book, do you offer a justification for it? Uh, he did offer a justification for it. He said that, that was, uh, they needed, the space was there, they needed it, uh, they had thousands of people, and they just, he just offered no apology. Now, why he needed a whole fancy hotel just for his own personal use, uh, he did not offer to explain that. He did live, I mean, he did explain the train, but he, uh, couldn't explain, I don't, you know, he just had an attitude. He was a, he was a senior officer, he had the power, and he was just gonna, gonna live. And I don't know what for, I mean, he was just, he, uh, he didn't even drink, I mean, what? Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org. Production services provided by Barrows Productions. <laughs>